Do I need this? I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, for such a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Michael, for being here with me. Thank you, all of you, for being here. It's a great pleasure. It's my second time at WITS. I was here many years ago. And um, I'm glad to come back. And such a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the first person that invited me to its Brenda Leibovitz. Uh, she passed away prematurely and she had invited me to come here. Then she died and then we had to cancel the, the venue. So the topic that I'm going to deal with you today is a very general topic which probably doesn't fit specifically with the topics that you are going to to deal with in this conference, but in, in fact they speak to them, of course. It's, and uh, but it is again not the first talk, so it will be general enough so that you can fit in the topics that you are uh, dealing with. And uh, this, in fact, is, is a part one of the talk, because uh, since I'm going to give uh, a talk later on this week here, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll be giving in these next four days four talks here in Johannesburg after a long time. It's really a uh, good presence. Um, you'll see that the second talk speaks to this one and, uh, and therefore follows on it. Well, I, I titled the, the talk uh, Decolonizing the University and Beyond. Why? I think we should start with some general ideas. The first one is that the way it has been dealt with predominantly and of decolonizing raises many problems to me, particularly in recent times. Which are the problems? First, decolonizing is a negative enterprise, right? It's deconstructing, it's undoing. What are we going to put in place? How are we going to replace it? What is the next? What's coming? What are our proposals? We have very, very, been very much uh, very good at the negative thinking in this respect, which I think is a typical thing of Eurocentric knowledge. But sometimes we fail on the alternatives. And uh, I think that, as I will explain next, uh, in the next talk, I don't think that we need alternatives in the world. What we think, what we need is an alternative thinking of alternatives. And that's the epistemic transformation that I'm calling for. So I think that the first one is that uh, we should ask this question. What are we going to put in place of it? The second idea that discomforts me is that the colonial, the decolonial assumes that we are in post-colonial society that decolonization addresses a problem, which was colonialism, is a thing of the past. And now we are going to decolonize, again, linear time. You know, we had colonialism, and now we have post-colonialism, and we are decolonizing. Well, I don't think that's right. I think that we live in colonial societies, and I'm going to explain. Colonialism is, is with us. And is very strong and probably more vicious today than in the past. So that's why I think that decolonization is troubling in this respect. So it is not so much that we are trying to do to undo a past and to build a new present and a new future, but I think that we have to do that and at the same time undo the present and undo the future. So I think it's a much more a uh, complex period. In fact, I'm going to show to you that we are in a period of recolonization, not of decolonization. We have the recolonization, of course, but two historic trends, decolonization and recolonization. Who is gaining ground today? That will be my question. The fourth general idea is that we should be 
Well, the fact that we have a temptation in this kind of studies is, is that uh, arrogant lucidity. All of a sudden, we seem that we are more intelligent than our predecessors. And these guys and these girls, they didn't see things that we are seeing. We are so much more intelligent and lucid, right? And sometimes we forget about our ancestors, the people that uh, did so beautiful work in the 60s, not to speak of 19th century or even 18th century. Um, but we think that we have an instant arrogance, instant lucidity. So my question is about what are you not seeing today? What are the ghosts that we don't see today? Or well, the ghosts that are so familiar that we don't even identify them as ghosts? And therefore, we go along with them. They are in the same room as we are, but we don't see them such. So, these some general ideas will help us to move along. First one, the problem with decolonizing is that we just, we live not just in colonial societies, we live in capitalist colonialist and patriarchal societies. The three main forms of modern domination are these three. There are satellite dominations, of course, like religion sometimes, or caste system, as in India now. But capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, in all very different forms, are with us. They have changed over time, of course, but they are with us. It has been a trap of the critical thinking, particularly the Eurocentric critical thinking. It took me a long time to decolonize my own Marxism, to think that colonialism was over with independences. It was not over. I was, in a sense, a member of the anti-colonial movement because you know, Portuguese colonialism lasted until so late that I couldn't come to the colonies in, in, in Mozambique. The government didn't allow me. So I came to Mozambique and Angola and uh, some to my prince and Cape Verde Islands and East Timor only after the independence. And in fact, many of the ministers, presidents, or friends of mine that have been with me at the university. So but this idea that these uh, three models, modes of domination are with us is very important. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that next uh, in next talk, but in any case, it's very important that colonialism, what ended with independence, was historical colonialism. That is to say, colonialism, you know, we have always the apartheid question, which is a different one, but we have uh, colonialism as a kind of uh, uh, invasion and occupation by a foreign country. Uh, that's historical colonialism. That's ended. With, with the independence. There are still some colonies, of course. The Sahrawi people know that very well. But uh, it, it ended. But it doesn't handle other forms of colonialism. And it is amazing for me that we accept so easily that colonialism was over. Because after all, the capitalism of the 17th century has nothing to do with capitalism of the 21st century. But we still say capitalism. Why not colonialism? Just because colonialism, historical colonialism ended? Well, there are many other forms of colonialism. I'll go into that in a moment. And they are with us. So in fact, decolonizing is not a question of the past. It's, it's our present. It's a struggle that has to be conducted. Why these three forms of domination coexist all the time since the 16th century? For a very simple reason, is that the free labor, which is uh, the core of capitalism, does not sustain itself without highly developed labor and non-paid labor. And the highly developed, underdeveloped, highly devalued labor and unpaid labor is provided by colonialism and patriarchy. That's why. In spite of all the victories of, of the feminist movement around the world, the feminist side goes on. In fact, increases in many countries at this 
point, right? That's why we have a, a, a study group at the United Nations on slave-like uh, labor. This is analogous to slave. It's interesting, analogous. It's, it's of course, it's slave labor, but since the states abolished the, the, the slavery, it has the United Nations, uh, because it's a diplomatic institution, has to say that it's not slavery, it's analogous to slave. But for the slaves themselves, that is no, no difference. Slave labor is growing around the world. Look at the figures. So I think that the free labor, which is characteristic of the capitalism, does not sustain itself. Capital one cannot reproduce itself with highly developed, highly developed labor and unpaid labor. So we have two forms of domination, colonialism and patriarchy, that provide this kind of labor. And that's why they can't go away. They are reproduced themselves in different ways. And I'm going to illustrate some of them. So it is because of that that we don't see that our societies today, because of colonial and, and patriarchy, there is, in fact, no humanity in our societies. Humanity is a project. Because in our modern society, capitalist, colonialist, and patriarchal society, there is no humanity without subhumanity. There are the subhumans that have to provide this highly developed labor or non-paid labor everywhere. It changes from one country to the next. Because capitalism always developed in a, a kind of an even but combined way. It's not in Europe that you see that so much, but you see that also. You see that in Bangladesh. I come from Buenaventura, which is in the Pacific, in Colombia, Afro-Colombian people. I never saw capitalism and colonialism merge together in such an intense way. How you kill people, how you destroy people. It's as harsh as the liquid cemetery that the Mediterranean Sea is now for the Europeans uh, as they see the migrant workers trying to income. So I think that this uh, has to understand a very important point of my talk, is that decolonizing doesn't make any sense if it is not anti-capitalist and anti patriarchal. And I think that the drama of our time is that domination works articulated in articulation. Capitalism goes together with colonialism and patriarchy all the time. I could give you an example of Brazil. Brazil recently elected a very neo-fascistic president. Capitalism became very harsh from one day to the next. <coughs> from one day to the next, the genocide of black kids in the peripheries of the city grew. The same week, Two weeks later, feminicide grew exponentially in, uh, in Brazil. So as capitalism becomes more aggressive, colonialism becomes more aggressive, and patriarchy becomes more aggressive. So I think that domination works in articulation. What is the drama of our society? Is that the resistance is fragmented. Domination is articulated, resistance is fragmented. Many movements that have been anti-capitalist have been racist and have been sexist. Many movements that have been anti-racial movements have been sexist and pro-capitalist. And many feminist movements have been pro-capitalist and men have been racist. So resistance is fragmented, domination is articulated. As long as you go in this, it will be very difficult to get out of the situation. What is an additional difficulty of our struggle, of our problems here, is that neoliberalism started as a political process, and now it is a civilizational process. It became a civilizational process. That's why we fail to see any alternative to it. Don't you be surprised that today is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism? It's interesting, right? The youth everywhere, they can see the, the end of the world and they go on the street like Greta, you know, do, doing a, a kind of climate stri a strike. But the end of capitalism is difficult. Well, the end of the world is something that's more fundamental. Capitalism is historical. At the beginning, 
should have an end. Everything in history has a beginning and an end. But apparently, has no end. Because neoliberalism has turned capitalism and this model of domination, colonialism and patriarchy, as endless and permanent. So we live in societies then in which all our political forms are under attack. The mark, liberal democracies may die democratically by electing neo-fascists to the posts. Trump is one. Bolsonaro is another one. Salvini is another one. Modi is another one. Orban is another one. Kaczynski is another one. I would go on. Why is that? Because liberal democracy is an island of democratic liberation in an archipelago of despotisms. We have just the political process in which you feel some deliberation, voting, and so on, fair representation. But most people in our societies, they live in democratic societies where they don't live democratically. Why they don't live democratically? Because their life chances depend on the veto power of more powerful people. That's why I've been saying that we live in societies that are politically democratic, but socially fascistic. And this is the situation now. And that's why it is so difficult to analyze this system, because it's an hybrid. It's democratic and it's fascistic. And we have to... Our instruments in social sciences are awkward, are primitive, to be able to account for these complexities. That's why more and more I resort to artists. And that's why I work so much with rappers with hip-hop culture around the world today, so you can see. Um, colonialism, what is specific about these uh, two other forms of domination aside from capitalism? Colonialism is pa and patriarchy. Is that they entail ontological degradation. Those that are subjected to these forms are not really fully human. They are subhuman. We know that by experience, of course, many of you here. That's why if 15 people, 15,000 people would die in this uh, cemetery, which is the Mediterranean, at, at this point, this liquid cemetery, if they were Europeans, there would be a revolution in Europe. But, but they are not European. They are not really human. They are subhuman. Right? So I think that racism, this ontological degradation, is there. It entails racism. It entails racism. And that's why inverted racism doesn't work. Because inverted racism involves also ontological degradation. does not supersede it. Xenophobia. But also concentration of wealth. Concentration of land in South Africa. Zones of sacrifice, collateral damage, walls, sometimes solid, sometimes liquid, made of human blood that fill our world, the resilience of slave labor. All this is this combination of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And that's why the power is abstract, because it is really more and more hidden behind these three forms of domination. So if you change the faces in power, you don't change power, not much changes. We have to change power, not the faces. Of course it is important to change the faces of power, but that's the first movement. Then we have to change the power structure. So I think that if you take this uh, into account as a preliminary comments, we will say that our societies have this, and I will work a little bit more in the next talk on this, are really crossed by this uh, fracture, actually, by this abyssal line. It's an abyssal line that divides humanity from subhumanity. The metropolitan society from the colonial society. There used to be geographies in historical colonialism, now they are sociabilities. In the same city, in the same university, in the same restaurant, on the same street, the Ibiza line is often there. Between those that are fully human 
and those that plant not fully human. So it is now it's not so much a question of geography, but a question of social representation. It's a question of political economy. It's a question of subjectivity. So it's a much more complex question. An immigrant, a, a black or Muslim immigrant that works in a restaurant in, in Paris, of course, he is in the metropolitan sociability, as right as a worker, he's protected, probably a member of a union. And probably doesn't uh, make as much money as the white worker side by side with him or the Christian worker. So there is some exclusion, but it's what I call non abyssal exclusion. And when this guy leaves the restaurant, goes out, and be taken over by the police, maybe arrested by the police, maybe victim of ethnic profiling just because he's a Muslim, just because he's black. And there's no right at that point. It's just subhuman. So it crossed the Abyssal line. Like the woman that is in the restaurant, and then she leaves the restaurant and goes to the Mitra, to the train in, in, in India, and is victim of gang rape. She moves, she crosses the Abyssal line from humanity to subhumanity. This is the life of most people in the world. And our theories purport to be universal based on the ideas of humanity, even though humanity doesn't go without subhumanity. But there is, a, it is my final introductory point, is that this decolonization goes together with recolonization these days. And quite frankly, that will be my topic on, uh, on Thursday, uh, on the fourth industrial revolution. I think that we are on the verge of a new form of colonialism, which is digital colonialism. There is a name already for that. And this uh, digital colonialism is even a specific, and I'm going to deal with this, for South Africa, because South Africa is a kind of an intermediate development country in Africa, like uh, Colombia, Argentina, or Brazil in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America, like Portugal or Spain in, in Europe. So, it may become a sub-imperial power in the continent. So it will be victim of colonialism and it will export colonialism to less developed countries in Africa. So this kind of uh, a prospect that I see coming there because we are assisting and, uh, to a fracture which I think is one of the most troubling ones between information and knowledge. Information has nothing to do with knowledge in the essence of the concept. Knowledge are the ideas that bridge the past, the present, and the future. Information is instant, eternal, present, fragmented, present as it stands. So I think that we have to work on this distinction if you want to decolonize the university, is whether we are going to favor Information or knowledge. And here you can see at your, your university, as I see in many other universities, some alignments here. Because our societies, particular societies underwent forms of colonialism like South Africa, they are divided usually in two types of people. The people that do not want to remember and the people that cannot afford to forget. The people that, that do not want to remember, they like information. The people that cannot afford to forget, they need knowledge, but that knowledge has been suppressed by the university because the universities teach the knowledge of the winners, not the knowledge of the losers. And that's why we have to undertake an epistemological transformation. So I think that this recolonization of the world as it taking place, I'll give you later on many examples in the other talk, shows one thing, everything that becomes a commodity in our society becomes a racialized and sexualized commodity today. The way the big data are being organized, the day the algorithm are being created in our society by these companies are racialized 
and sexualized. So I think that we have that in mind. We can see that this logic of recolon instant, incessant recolonization of the world has taken several forms from the 16th century up until now. And every time a new form comes in, the previous ones remain, but they are reconfigured. They change. The first one was religion. The second one was science and technology. The third one is information. Our current stage. And uh, you can see some changes in the characteristics. For instance, as the time goes by and you move from one to the other, in position persuasion, that's a typical thing of ideological inculcation on the colonial times, it becomes more abstract. Power is becoming powerless. Power is becoming dronified. It's a drone. We don't see it. No human being is conducting it. Who runs financial capital? We don't know the names. We used to know the name of Hitler or Mussolini, but you don't know who runs financial capital and runs our lives everywhere. We know probably who runs the internet, but it's not Zuckerberg or, or Bill Gates. There are many other people we don't know. And these two powers they have no borders, right? They're absolutely global. So it becomes more abstract. And secondly, it relies more and more on machines. Religion relied solely on humans, so much so that it needed a superhuman god, of course. Uh, was an extra human to convince the people of humanity, right? Now, we don't need that because you have so many machines that replace that. So this is the background on which we could start a discussion on decolonizing knowledge and the universe. And the premise is, as far as knowledge is concerned, you can see that decolonizing knowledge is one of many other tasks that we have to undertake because uh, of capitalism. We cannot do that without an anti-capitalist struggle. We cannot do that inside universities. I spend uh, my time today, 50% of my time at university and 50% of my time with social movements. If I were just within my university and these uh, grounds, I think it would be impossible to conduct the epistemologies of the South. Because if you change, if you try to do an epistemic transformation, but does not address the lives of people out there, it's more of the same. It's more of the same. So it's very demanding on us, right? And uh, it's, it's interesting because Africans have I've had a, a very long-standing debate here between two models of the intellectual in many countries in Africa since the 60s, as probably you know, uh, Mamdani and many others, my dear friend, uh, Issa Shivzi and so many others have written extensively on that, the scholar and the public intellectuals. Uh, one is uh, in his office and uh, writes uh, his books or rare books, the other try to be more relevant to society. So that was the dichotomy between excellence and uh, relevance. I think that we have to supersede that. We'll be excellent to the extent that we are relevant and vice versa. So the premises. First of all, all knowledges are incomplete. There is no knowledge in general. Any system of knowledge is a system of ignorance. When we try to teach our students, particularly younger students coming from other cultures, we are producing ignorance. Because we are really developing, making invisible the knowledge they come from, from their communities, urban or rural, from their families, from their past, from their ancestors. So you produce ignorance in order to produce knowledge. So there is no knowledge in general, no ignorance in general. It was a philosopher that in 14th century, Nicholas of Cusa, that said what is one of my 
guiding principles. What we should aim at is to be learned ignorant. Learned ignorant. Know that we don't know. Because most of the Western thinking is ignorant ignorant. It ignores, but it doesn't know that it ignores. So this is very arrogant, and we should, of course, do away with that. So dominant knowledges, of course, reproduce domination. That's their task. So we at the universities have been reproducing capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. That's as simple as that, but with contradiction. Many contradictions. And one of my problems with some of the decolonial, particularly Latin American decolonial uh, trends, is that they make a caricature of Western thinking. It, it's, or, or the dominant thinking. It's very easy to make a caricature and then destroy it. We have seen that. But you have to see the complexities. The guy that taught me this could have, could have been Franz Fanon, of course. It was a great influence on me. But it was a Milker Cabral a great liberator of African, Portuguese colonialism in Africa. Because he said in several, in many meetings, in Cape Verde Islands, for instance, in the training of cars, let's see what the colonizer's knowledge is useful for us. Don't dismiss it. We have to take into account what they have done, but see the, the contradictions among them and explore them. I'll give you an example just for you to have an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, we usually identify uh, our concepts of nature. I'll work a little bit more on this later on, uh, next talk. The questions of nature as, uh, you know, as a Rex extension from Descartes, the idea that nature has no divine dignity, only human beings have divine dignity, and therefore, we can do whatever we do we want with uh, nature. So nature is out there, it's not society. So this distinction between society and nature is absolutely crucial to the Western thinking. It, it is fair to identify that with dominant Western thinking. What we should know is that precisely at the same time, another philosopher, in my view, a better philosopher, was proclaiming an alternative idea, and it had some traction in Europe at the time, but of course it was not used. And you'll see why. That was Spinoza. Spinoza has two concepts of nature, natura naturata and natura naturans. Natura naturata is, of course, the stable, these things, of course, they are nature and you know, they are objects. But natura naturans, is the nature that is naturing and nurturing. Is the nature that is the center of life. That's where we come from. And therefore, nature does not belong to us. We belong to nature. It's a completely different view. Why the Spinozian concept didn't go forward only the Cartesian? For a simple reason, because the Cartesian notion was the only one that could allow the Europeans to exploit the natural resources of Latin America and of the world in general. The pillage of the, human, the, the natural resources was based on this condition, could not be Spinoza. That's why he, was, he, he managed to be excommunicated both by the Catholics and by the Jews, which is interesting. There's a record, almost. Uh, so this diversity of knowledge is what fascinates me. And then to try to uh, to say that we are not in the decolonizer, not necessarily anti-science. The problem is that science is one knowledge among many others. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that. And not all science, but some kind of science, which I'll, because science is also internally plural. And the first ones to tell us that were the feminist epistemologists. And we know that. So, the university now, it, Decolonizing knowledge, but the title is Decolonized University. The university is a bifurcation situation now. Bifurcation in the, in the terms of the Ilya Prigogine. That is to say, a small change may change completely the nature of university in the future because the, the system of the university is so far of equilibrium that a small change may be fatal to the university. 
what is the bifurcation. Is that for the first time, and university has a very long, you know, the modern universities has a long history, and if we can see that, what we can see the pre-modern universities, all of them are African, as you know, from Timbuktu to Al Azhar, much before Bologna, two or three centuries before, but we sometimes tend to forget that. Huh? For the first time, our question is not about the future of the university. It's about whether the university has a future. Because the changes now are so dramatic in many countries, they may be not dramatic at this, but you know, look at that. <laughs> that uh, we may, in a few decades, do not recognize this un our universities as universities. They may be business enterprises, they may be something else, but they are not really universities. If we allow them to pursue this line. So let me elaborate a little bit on, on, the, on the crisis. I've written extensively about the crisis of the university and um, already some 30 years ago, I identified three major crises of the university, the crisis of legitimacy, the crisis of hegemony, and the institutional crisis. And I dealt with in detail about each one of them. I'm not going to do here, but in any case, I think that this crisis aggravated in the last 20, particularly the last 20 or 30 years, to an extent that now we really have uh, some doubts about the future of the university. Because the universities are already at this stage, particularly at this stage, are already in a difficult position because of their mission. Because of what, do I, what do they do? They educate people. But what is education? Education, in fact, is to try to train social beings that can conceive themselves as co-owners of a shared future. That they represent the world as their own future, not as the future that was done by someone, as in colonial times, so to say, right? The problem is that the shared future is created, particularly in colonial societies, on broken pasts, on separate pasts, on paths of violence. How can we construct shared futures on this basis? Education in colonial sites are built on ruins. How do we build the new on ruins? Well, if you read my last book, The, the, the End of the Cognitive Empire, I have a concept that will help us here, is the concept of ruined seeds. I think the ruins, the ruins are where the seeds are for innovation at this point. So ruins are not bad, necessarily. As not all, conservation is conservatism. So we have to be more subtle in that. So I think that the crisis have aggravated why? Because the, the universities have been subjected to two pressures, opposing pressures, that um, are really destabilizing it. The first one, is the pressure of uh, what I call university capitalism. Uh, since the Merrill Lynch produced a, 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 a report in the 90s saying that education, health, uh, and uh, young financial services would be the most profitable areas for capital in the next 20, 30 years, education and health. All of a sudden, we see a great a great uh, push for the privatization of, of universities, for creating multiple universities, and tailor-made type of universities to the needs of the market, to the needs of capitalism. So the idea was that you saw probably in these countries, we saw in many other countries, that the universities all of a sudden are asked to train people for the skills needed by the market. Nobody knows what those skills are. Very often when the skills arrive, the, the skills are not there, the jobs are not there anymore. <laughs> but we believe that we have to train those. And that was just the first phase. The second phase was the university should not just produce 
the, the, the skills that are needed by the market. But there should be a market, it should be a market for the universities. So the free universities go away, you have to pay fees, and so on, and students become, uh, of course, uh, your consumers, right? And professors, proletarians of the university, right? That's the trend. And finally, you know, you are a market, then you have to be run like a market. And you are a business enterprise. These are the three phases. In my university, I can't see the phases because I work in, in different universities where this uneven but combined development goes on. I can see that in medicine is much more developed than in Quebec. <coughs> Clearly. In medicine, they are closing down all the departments uh, that have no market value. You know, uh, comparative studies, literary comparative studies, ethnographic studies, and so on. And at the same time, nanotechnology, biology, and so on, all of them. New departments almost every week. So I think that what we have seen is that this capitalism, uh, university capitalism, put such a pressure on the university. And this pressure, was even more contradictory because at the same time there was a bottom-up demand on the university. The, the people start asking more from the university, more social responsibility. And the university has been pressed by the bottom-down the, and top-up type of pressures. And we are, in a sense, very much in that uh, in one way or the other. As the hegemony, the crisis came from two sources. The first one is that the university and the hegemony are producing uh, high learning and, uh, you know, the, the most sophisticated, most rigorous knowledge in society. Suddenly, in some countries, gradually in others, the governments decided not to ask so reports about, you know, rigorous knowledge for public policy. Not ask the universities, but consultancy firms. And all of a sudden you see a move from university to think tanks. With another logic, the logic of the client, because the client pays for the service. When I see President Ramaphosa uh, talk, talking about the fourth industrial revolution, he cites, not university papers, he cites papers from the think tanks, Accenture, McKinsey, and and so on. It's not normal. Modi in India does the same. They don't ask the university. They ask the think tanks. So. The second one is that the universities were also the basis for the building of the project of a country. Even though the project was as exclusionary as you can imagine, because it was a capitalist, colonialist, and patriarchal project, it was a country project. Because capitalism was organized on the base of nation state basis, right? So you cannot understand Brazil without the University of São Paulo, you can uh, understand Mexico without the UNAM, you cannot understand Portugal without Coimbra, you cannot understand uh, France without Paris University, so on. You go on, right? All of a sudden, neoliberalism does not care about national projects. National projects are an obstacle. Because the economy is global. The elites are group. And the children of the elites, they don't have, they are not trained in our university, the public universities of their own countries. Sometimes even high school, they don't trust that university. They go to the global universities, to the UK, to the, to the United States. They are the only places reliable because they don't have to know about their own countries. They have to know about figures. And the figures are the information. That's why it's the new wave of recolonization that's coming in. Right? So I think that because the university was really under this tension, particularly in Africa, but also in general, between universalism and nationalism, you know, at the same time universal ideas, at the same time a national project, now you can see that this is in trouble. And that's why we have uh, uh, all these problems. But the legitimacy crisis was also very strong. Why? Because the, the idea that the university was, not, is, was inaccessible to people that were racially, sexually discriminated in our societies and also uh, in economic terms from the popular classes. It was an elitistic project for elitistic knowledge. We knew that. But there is a, a trend 
of fighting for more access, to democratize the access, not to change the curriculum, that's a different thing, but to democratize the access. Once the access is democratized, paradoxically, the university does not become more legitimate, it becomes less. Why? Because the kids, the people, the young people that come from other cultural backgrounds, from other racial backgrounds, from other sexual backgrounds, now they see in a close-up view how racist, how capitalist, how sexist the university is. So paradoxically, the misery of the university is eviscerated, is visible to anyone. And it is this exposure that the university is really dealing with it's so difficult because many people really don't understand. Professors, particularly older professors, but after all, we did so well bringing in these people. They, they are not grateful, in a sense, right? Because they see how miserable and how elitistic we were. So I think that I'm not going to speak about the, some of the specificities of Africa now, <coughs> because I want to move on to the end. But what I want to see is that side by side with legitimacy and the Germany crisis, we had also an institutional crisis. And the institutional crisis was that universities were run by professors, sometimes with help of the students and the staff. And all of a sudden, we see the rise of the administrators in the universities. And uh, many of our faculty members see the administrators as anti-intellectual managers, and for the very good reasons. And so it was part of the idea of becoming a commodity, the university becoming a commodity. Because what, what is, if you look at what has been discussed in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the World Trade Organization, is the, the, the procurement of services, is the liberalization of services, 12 services, one is universities, so that uh, WITS can sell the, the sociology or education uh, you know, program in, in the, uh, here, can sell it to Bangladesh. Uh, and you can, packages you can send, you can sell, you can buy, and so on. How can you sell and buy if you don't have a price, if you don't have a price tag? You need a price tag. That's why there are rankings. That's why there are ratios. That's why there are outputs. That's why you have to publish. And the numbers and the quality doesn't count at all because nobody is interested in quality of research. It's just the impact study. It's just the, the journal and the number. So we are entering a period of a metric society. It's not the mediatic society, it's a metric society. And this metric society is a tsunami going on through the universities now. It's so much so that in fact now we see a complete perversion of the scientific output of professors. Because in fact the professors have to do and researches to have to publish under these conditions, and these conditions are precisely this are this idea of the matrix. And the matrix is part of the digital industry, so that you can put the price tag on bits, and it will be different from Joburg, and then for the UCT, and so if you want to sell or buy one of these products, you know what you have, you have to pay. So it is so, so much so that we have, you know, you have uh, academia, EDU, your paper has been uh, quoted 30 times. Mm. Nobody's interested is in saying, if the, 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 the person that quoted me says that your paper is rubbish. <laughs> now the important thing is you have been quoted, right? So what I call at this point is that we are in a period of tinderization of knowledge. You ask for clicks, you ask for retweets, for likes, for followers. That is to say, the quality of research is a contest for virality. Your, your test became viral. You know, can you imagine research? I think that we may laugh, but it's very tragic because creativity is stagnating. We are killing creativity. Time to brooding, time to reflect, to linger on. We need slow time to do research, serious research. And uh, in fact, we have managed our universities in our world at large, 
to try to transform time into a lack of time. Nobody has time for anything. So we have to manage lack of time, not really time. Under these conditions, I think that the university moves on more for information, and this will be a recolonization, than to knowledge. And the knowledge is divided in two kinds of knowledge. We used, used to be used to the idea that knowledge is value, is intrinsic. Knowledge is value because it's good knowledge. Now there are two kinds of knowledge. The knowledge that is good because it has a market value, and the knowledge that has no market value. And many universities are favoring, in fact, the knowledge with market value. Mm. That's why biology develops, nanotechnology develops. Well, literary studies, comparative studies, has no market value. They should not have any market value. Philosophy has no market value. By education, not much, they should at least. So I think that this is the situation in which we are now. And um, the problem is so complex that in order to engage with decolonization, we have to see that even the crisis that we go on now, if we look at the papers that are being produced at university, it shows that the university does not know how to analyze in its own terms its own crisis. We import concepts for the crisis. We import ideas for the crisis. We are not, in fact, defining the crisis in university terms, even though it is the crisis of the university. So I think that we lost the hegemony to define the crisis of the university. So we may be at the mercy of administrators and uh, of course people that uh, want to tell. But this is complex. And uh, there is a final note here, which I think I'd like to uh, address to you, is that this is complex. It's always complex, these things, right? Because in spite of all these problems that we are facing, there is a very interesting thing. Whenever despots come to power, they attack the university. Why is that? We have all these problems. We university people, we know all these problems and we, know you win, we want to be better. But once they come to power, the first thing is to attack the university. Bolsonaro in Brazil reduced the, the, the budget of the university, all universities, 30%. Even Duke in Colombia did the same. They invoke austerity measures, they invoke things like that, but it's the university, not the military. It's the universities, right? So why is that? Because they want the reports by Accenture, by Deloitte, by Kim K, that is over there, by McKinsey. There is, they want by consultancy firms. They don't want the reports, plural, critical, independent knowledge that we should be producing at the university. So I think that we have now the, the two questions that I leave open for a later discussion, uh, later in the week, but it's, these are the questions. First of all is that, of course, I'm a tragic optimist. So I, I see, I always do my diagnosis, but I refuse because I work with social movements and the people that work with social movements refuse not to see an alternative, because there is an alternative. And I see the alternatives coming up around the world. The problems are this. Who are the people that are going to fight for the alternatives? The social classes, the social groups. The university was not problematic because it had support of the elites. In many countries, the support is not there anymore. That's why there are financial cuts. Who is going to support? The middle classes? The popular classes? But who, the university was so arrogant vis-a-vis -vis the popular classes. So arrogant vis-a-vis -vis even the middle classes. They consider them stupid, ignorant. Can they now ask for the support of the classes that they despised for so long? Well, they have to conquer them. They have to persuade them that it is in their benefit that the university goes on, and it is. And that's my program is precisely on this. But the second question is, under which conditions should we defend the public university? We cannot depend. If we do this criticism, we cannot defend the public university. As it is, we have to change it. Well, my idea is that 
the conditions are an epistemic transformation. And uh, I've been calling that the epistemology of the cell. That will be the topic of the positivism type of, of uh, epistemologies and knowledges that I'll be discussing uh, after tomorrow, tomorrow actually. And uh, so I'll be discussing on this alternative and saying that, in fact, there is room for that. But it entails an epistemic transformation. And after that epistemic transformation, probably the university won't be the same as we know it, but in a different way. Not the business one, but some institution that is finally at the services of the anxieties and the aspirations of the popular classes. Because we have to face one thing, and that's the question I leave you today. Because we teach basically the knowledge of the winners, at as told by the winners, historical winners, it's not surprising that we train conformists. That's what we train. At best, we have trained incompetent rebels. <laughs> I think it is time to do to train competent rebels. That's the task for next talk. Thank you. I wonder if we could actually elaborate uh, on, on that, because that's the trend I saw in Latin America, mm -hmm. where there's a clear link between social movements and the university. And when they organize events like this, there's that kind of interface, visible interface, where you can talk about the impact, of the value of that, and the significance of that. Good. So I, I'll answer these questions, and then uh, to the best of my ability, and then we can do a second round if uh, you're interested. Well, Sanjay, I, I absolutely agree with you, and um, I've been thinking a lot about that. I didn't mention that, and I should, because the title of Congress, the, the, this Congress, uh, this seminar, where you invited me to do so, I, I think that you, are, you are absolutely right, because herbalism creates really ontological degradation. You know, it is really structurally similar to colonialism and patriarchy. Period. That's absolutely. So, I think that I have to fit in and fit in, and well, it's not difficult because what I've been trying to say is that these three forms of domination are never the only forms of domination. That they need satellite universities. For instance, I, I remember, for, well, as, as I said, in, in India. Well, in Dutva now, the, you know, the, the extreme Hinduism. Is of course trying to make uh, uh, Muslim Indians, Muslim that are not really Indians because they are not Hindus. So I, I think that there are satellite uh, uh, dominations. Could ableism be a satellite or a fourth form? Let me think about that, uh, Sachai. I, I, I hope that this seminar will help me to solve this problem and pr probably in my uh, next writing, I'm sure that I'll account for that, because uh, in my center we have a, a group of disability studies, we have been working on this, uh, on these ideas of non-being, the zone of non-being, the zone, as you know, as I'm going to talk tomorrow on the, 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 the sociology of absences and the disabilities and so on, so you just gave uh, us powerful examples of that, and I, I really thank you for, you know my work, people sometimes only know my work from the Bismarck of South on words, but you, you started much early on with it toward the new common sense and toward the new legal common sense. By the way, Sajay, it comes out next year in third edition by Cambridge University Press. And do you like that, the, the new version? The end civil, because I, he mentioned, mentioned my, my a concept which is crucial for my work is that I uh, uh, what I've been trying to do with the liberal concepts is to deconstruct them and to try to uh, that they work against themselves. That is to say, for instance, I don't accept the concept of civil society. I think it's a non-concept. Yes. But I think that there are three civil societies. The intimate civil society, the strange civil society, which is the model of civil society, and the uncivil civil society. Society of those that do not belong that are on social fascism. So, Sajai knew that. Thank you for reminding the audience uh, um, of that. 
Yes, as, as to the, the, the third question I take more of the comment, and uh, I think next week, uh, uh, next talk I'll be working, definitely, there are lots of things that we can do. Uh, and uh, I think that we have probably uh, not to do it alone, we have to be more collective on this. Uh, we have to do so many things collectively, and um, this neoliberalism is taking us to such individual possessivism that uh, or possessive individualism that really frightens me. But um, I'm even going to talk about the association of research assistants to work with foreigners, foreign researchers in this country and other countries, which has been put forward in this country recently. So, uh, but concerning the social movements, well, this, the, the, the particular the arts is why is it so important because uh, the arts were, you know, in the modern forms of rationality, you see that, for instance, in Habermas, is very close, to, that is the scientific technology uh, rationality of science, the moral practice is, is law and morals, and then the arts and literature, and uh, the aesthetics and the expressive rationality. But they were rationalities, and they were the three forms. They developed canons, they developed institutions, and so on. But I think that the arts, like the concept of community, the, the arts were not so colonized by the Western thinking because they were not so relevant for the reproduction of society. They were not considered so relevant. Uh, gradually, the, the scientific and technological rationality and the moral practice were the main forms of rationality. Arts were left, that's why the, the artists were crazy, they were really autonomous. You know, not the autonomy of uh, entrepreneurship now, which is a disease in our universities, is to ask the students to be entrepreneurs, which is really a disaster, it's a crime against humanity, I have to say, <laughs> because in fact you are asking them to be safe slaves, because they have no conditions to be autonomous. You ask, ask someone to be autonomous without the conditions to be autonomous. Well, the artist in Montmartre, of course he was autonomous. He lived very poorly, he didn't have a contract. But they could, uh, you know, paint the paintings that he wanted, right? Or she. But now the people that are autonomous are waiting for the Uber Eats or for whatever, right? So it is not, they are not creating their own work. They are waiting for what comes. So that's why it's self-slavery. And the body, is, uh, as I will explain, is fundamental. So the art remained uh, an area of more contradiction where the canon was always being fought against, expanding canon, and when I start, when the crisis of the social movements of the, because it became the 90s and the 2000s, I saw that in many countries the artists were the ones that were conducting the discourse of protest against inhumanity in our societies. All our problems, the, 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 all this wealth concentration, for instance, right? How is it possible that the eight richest people in the world have the same wealth as the half poor of the humankind, 3.5 million billion people? Nothing happens. I mean, it, if it were the beginning of the 20th century, that was a justification for the Russian Revolution. No, nothing happens. We go on. So the artists are the ones that are, you know, calling our attention to the, the horror of our society. They resist the trivialization of horror that you are undergoing very little. And that's why, for instance, if you look at the protest songs of the 70s, uh, who are the protest, protest songs of our time? Are the rappers. With all the limitations, they were male chauvinistic all the time, in the beginning. I learned a lot with, uh, you know, Kate Kenny West, Jay-Z, when they were very young. They, they, they taught me a lot at that time. Now, uh, Kenny West now is, is someone that God spoke to, so it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but this pro-Trump and so on, but this happens. Uh, but at this age, it was absolutely fabulous. And, uh, and they taught me that my sociological discourse about society was not radical enough and never as radical as they were able to do. And even the protest songs that we saw in the men singers that were the protest songs, now were these people. And these people came from the, the other side of the Abyssal line, as I explained. They came from the colonial 
sociability. People from the ghettos, people from the periphery, urban peripheries, they were the ones that were trying to bring a different kind of art. And I, I and that's the argument that I've been making in, in, uh, in other topics uh, when I talk about the arts and, and the Epistemology of the South, is the, these artists, is not the institutionalized artists of the galleries, is the artists everywhere I see the, the graffiti, the hip hop, the break dance, all these things that are happening, the queer art that we saw, and I'm, I'm anxious to see what is being done here in Johannesburg, uh, they, what they are doing, expanding the canon of, uh, of, of the aesthetics, bringing a new aesthetics, and they know something that social scientists, philosophers don't know. They walk on the abyssal line. So they walk in such a way that they see both sides. Because the, the social science, usually this is only the metropolitan side. The rest is a problem, right? They don't. They see the problem is that we have these two societies. And sometimes they were raised up in the colonial sociability, sometimes they were in the metropolitan society. Because they, they, even when they are successful financially, some of them don't sell their soul. Some sell. I think Kenny did. That's my disgust. But, uh, but uh, other people didn't, and I'm in here. So I work with them. And I'll, 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 I'll have to tell you, so I, I can send you the paper on the arts, the manifest on arts and human. I presented at the Biennial of Art in Havana uh, two months ago at, at 13 Biennial. Uh, and I had presented before at Verbier in Switzerland. So it's, it's a manifesto about the ways in which the artist uh, that I'm appealing to is a post abyssal artist that become, begins as an absent artist. Nobody recognizes him or her as an artist. Then he makes his way or her way. The problem with the artist, which I think is fascinating, is that he, works on the, he or she works on the abyssal line, and very often he moves to the metropolitan society. His work or her work starts to be you know, known, well paid for, the festivals, the books, uh, the, the paintings, and so on. But he or she moves alone, never his other community. The community stays in the ghetto. The community stays on the colonial side of society, but he moves or she moves. And the appeal is that they could do more in this sense. Their social responsibility is as the social responsibility of scholars and, and so on. So that's what I, the, the, try, the, the, the type of approach that, um, that I'm trying to produce here. And sometimes I do what I've been discussing about the ecology of knowledge is that we have to uh, interplay with knowledge because for some kinds of things we need some knowledge, for other kinds of things we need other types of knowledge. For instance, I give my classes, and they'll, well, not in English so far, but it'll be available in Portuguese and Spanish, and in, in Spanish uh, is being produced now, is that all, my class from 2011, 2016, uh, they were uh, transcribed and revised and so on, and the classes are all there. Uh, could be also in English, but up until now they were not. But the summaries of my class are done in rap. So I have two doctorals, I have doctoral students, I have slam poets in my class. So the following day when I start teaching, the previous class is summarized by them in rap or in slam poetry or in dance. It's, it's really a fabulous thing. And believe me, it is for instance, I have a class on, it's a pity, but probably you can't read the Portuguese or Spanish. I write, I, I give a class on Abyssa line, and then watch, see the rap on the Abyssa line. Mm. It's about the same thing, but it's absolutely different. So I think that this type of ecology of knowledge that I think we, we need. Well, I think that, uh, uh, as I say, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll work more on your, your questions, and. Uh, and uh, as far as Michael is concerned, well, there is a big debate now whether 
there are social movements in Africa uh, because uh, the idea it was that social movement was something in Latin America and so on. It's a conceptual problem and it's part of our, you know, uh, the limits of our knowledge because uh, of course there are lots of movements and, uh, and there are lots of social organizations and movements in Africa. Uh, but in fact, the World Social Forum show that. I mean, I've been working with uh, landless peasants from South Africa. <laughs> They're not small peasants because there are none, basically, in, in, in Africa, organized as such. Where did I meet them? In Arare, in the meeting of Via Campesina. Because as you know, the Via Campesina, which is the organization of uh, family peasants, uh, as a, an, is an international, some 140 countries are members of the Via Campesina, and, uh, and the leader of that, the president, is a dear friend of mine. In fact, there is an interview uh, a conversation between myself and Elizabeth in my project, go to my page of Alice page and the conversations of the world. And some are in English, one with Mogob Ramosa, with Mudimba here in, Afri in, in South Africa, and one with Elizabeth Mofu. Elizabeth Mofu is the president of Via Campesina. So I was there with social movements. On Saturday, we were going to have a meeting, but the president couldn't, from uh, Abai Hali, the, the she 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 Shekwell dwellers here. So, you know, the, 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 the land, the, you know, the Sintetu, I don't know how to say, well, the homeless people here in, the, in, in, or the people that need a house and so on. There is a strong movement here, and the people are working with them. So, they are probably, we have to reconceptualize the idea of social movements. They, are, they, have some, they don't have the same organi organicity. But they are present there. I mean, of course, feminist movements and so on, they are very divided, very separate, but we have them. So I've been, I've been with them, not so much in South Africa, because I think that my suggestion, well, in, next, uh, in my next talk, I'm going to propose that the WITS organize a UPMS. UPMS, you know, is these uh, uh, workshops of the Popular University of Social Movements. For today's, we bring one-third intellectuals and two-thirds social movements together, organization of civil society. And we spend in residence for two days discussing topics that are selected by them, and nobody speaks for more than five minutes. <laughs> so that's a suggestion. For yeah. Yeah. So I think that I answered. So if there are any more questions, I'll be glad. Second, please. Well, I, I've been uh, writing extensively about the foreign uh, foreign aid, because I think that was, uh, it developed as part of the neoliberal uh, thing. The neoliberalism did something very clearly, and many people, even critical and on the left, didn't see that on time, is that since the states are corrupt and are uh, predators and so on, no money goes to the states, go to civil society. So from then on, they start pouring money into civil society organizations and they create their own civil society. So the, sometimes the, they are extensions. The local organizations are extensions of global. Some openly so, other in disguise. Some were grassroots organizations that then were co-opted. And why do they are co-opted? You know, I've seen that in Mozambique very extensively, is that once you receive these donations, there are, you know, the terms of reference. You have to conduct this and that. You can do this and that, not that and that. So you have really to comply with certain restrictions uh, that are all of them benevolent. Uh, they are also, fra all of them phrased in the best terms possible, you know, to help you, but create what I call a sociology of absences. In order to address those questions, what are the questions that we are not going to address? What are particular questions of power, particular questions of conflict, because donors don't like conflict and power, because the power is their own and the conflicts are the ones that they manage. So they don't care about it, they care about problems. So they reproduce the idea that the North is the solution and the South is the problem, basically. So but it has been since the 17th century, that has been the way. So that's why it's another, for me, foreign aid is really a form of recolonization. 
And I think development is another concept that I'll, I'll deal with. Well. It's another concept that we should revise uh, profoundly because of the connotations that it has and how it was developed. How did the concept of development came and how the develop aid, why aid, right? Well, in fact, there are plenty of studies now that development aid prevents people from developing. Basically, that's that's as, as radical as I can be in that regard. But th this would take us... Uh, the tragic optimism is a concept that I've been uh, using, probably other people do, uh, but I've been using uh, to say the following. We, we I think that, that, that we need two basic emotions in life particularly if you are social active and political active. In my case, if you are on the left, is you have to be like, like that. These are the emotions or effects, as Spinoza calls them, fear and hope. We need both. Because fear without hope gives to depression, gives to give up struggle, victimhood. That's the only word that I find problematic. I don't like victims. I like resistance. It's a victim who is, uh, they are victimized. And there are lots of, uh, as there are no po poor people. They are impoverished people, not poor. And the only they are impoverished because they are enriched people. So I think that uh, hope and fear, but with hope, just hope, without fear is voluntarism. And this can also be dangerous. There are a couple of these, these 1% of the richest people in the world. I think they live just with hope, no fear. They fear nothing. In fact, the arrogance of power, what I call the dronification of power, is that it doesn't even recognize that there are enemies. You know, the drones, well, there's a metaphor I take from the military drones, no? The military, the military drones are killing in Yemen, but they are being shot from Nebraska from the screens of the computers. So, so far away. They don't even meet the opponent, the enemy. So this dronification is miniat miniaturizing us. We seem to be too small to fight this kind of power. And we have to reduce power to a human scale so can you can fight it. So tragic optimism is this mix between fear and hope. It's to make a radical diagnosis of our time but at the same time, leave hope. Because some people are falling into cynicism. And this is another Western disease. And some of the philosophers now are really acclaimed, Peter Sloterdijk, for instance, in Germany, because they are cynical. I mean, they, they, they write books about cynicism. They may be critical of cynicism, but they don't see any alternative. I think the Eurocentric knowledge is absolutely exhausting. They don't see alternatives. And that's why the extreme right is also rising in Europe. So I, I refuse not to see alternatives. But since, I, as I said, we need an alternative thinking of alternatives. So tragic optimist is basically that, that concept. Well, the, the, the third question is, is a very important question. Well, it took us uh, a long to discuss this um, transformation, this opposition. It was very clear in the in the 60s between relevance and excellence, um, because there were African intellectuals that were for excellence, and others that were for relevance. Uh, public intellectuals on one side, scholars. Uh, Ali Masrui, for instance, was more on the scholar side. Issa Shivji, for instance, was more on the public intellectual side. I could cite many others. Nkrumah, which is my guru also, if you read this book of uh, 1965, Neocolonialism, you learn about a lot about current trends now. But was a public intellectual in my view. So this was the question, uh, and it was a long debated question. You find lots of colleagues in Africa that are dealing with that. That debate came later on to the Codesria, to this council of research based in uh, in, uh, in Dakar, 
because for Ashim, bamboo was for excellence and other people for relevance. So that was the conflict at the time. It was a very harsh conflict at the time. But then there was something perverse that happens. Is that excellence morphed into efficiency, into merit. It's not the creativity of the independent intellectual that may criti criticize power, uh, be, the, be it on the, on, because the problem of, of, of the scholars in Africa was they were with the national movements in the anti-colonial movement, but when the nationalists came to power, they sometimes became very oppressive, despotic. And therefore, they have to, they want to keep their autonomy. And in order to keep their autonomy, they would be scholars, independent scholars. It was a very difficult position, particularly because these despots were not despots the way we think today of the despots that we have in the world, even though they are uh, democratic elect. I mean, for me, Julius Nehrer was never a despot. But for a while, it was one party system. Samora Michel was never a despot, but was one a party system. And that's why they assassinated probably South Africa intelligence with some internal complicity. So I think that this thing transformed relevance also at a morphing transformation. Relevance now is the expert. The university should produce experts. And our colleague from the think tank, I'm going to answer her, is that the university is not producing experts. They should the people that know a lot about something small. The, the idea of the expert is that we have to be expert on a small thing. We may ignore everything, but we are an expert. It's a laser beam type of, of scholarship. While the relevance was something broader, was the, uh, the involvement with the politics of the continent, not just of your country. We were Pan-African, many of them, right, at the time. So it was a very broad discussion. But now is the relevance is the relevance for the market, for the fourth industrial revolution. How relevant this is and that and so on. So it is this, both the relevance was narrowed down and excellence was also narrowed down. Uh, just merit evaluated by outputs not by quality of research, right? And do you know that all the scholars that we read today, if they were evaluated by metrics, they would never succeed. They would never have a post at the university. You know, Spinoza wrote one book while he was alive. So this guy would never become a professor. You see, so the criteria is that they are promoting a kind of a mass type of mediocre professors. And sometimes the people that are, you know, they take more time to... I'm not saying that there are not people, professors, that are lazy, for instance. There are many people in some universities that, you know, they produce their PhD and never produce anything else. No, this is not uh, the model for us. We have to keep uh, producing, but with quality. Why quality doesn't matter at the university knowledge today and the capitalism? That's what I resent most, because the university is the basis where we could have this quality idea. So I think that you have to fight, but never alone, if you are a young scholar. Please, never do. Because if you are, you are going to be wiped out. <laughs> Neutralized very easily. You don't get tenure to begin with. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have to organize. Never do that in your own name. Try to have an association. Mm -hmm. Young professors. Try to unite. That's the logic of the social movement, social organization. Unite. Never put your name in first place. You don't even have sometimes to have the names, but organize collectively. And spend a lot of time in meetings. People don't like meetings anymore. Because they they because the agenda is set out for them, because they cannot elaborate their own agenda. But if you can produce your own agenda, then you can spend hours deliberating. And this is time. This is university time. To be four hours in a debate is good. I mean, it's not bad. Unless you are insulting each other. That, no, that's not debate. It's insulting. And, and in fact, sometimes 
we fall into that uh, into that level. But please, I think there are opportunities and there are possibilities. But you have to unite and have new ideas about what has to be done. You cannot just criticize. Because you can say, well, you want to destroy this and then. So what are you going to put in place? And then you start to stutter. So you have to be elaborate on your ideas uh, for, uh, uh, for the future. But never forget one thing. The enemies of the university are not just outside the university, are inside. There are many people that feel very comfortable with university capitalism. And they prosper with that. So that's where it is so difficult now to unite professors, particularly in the, at the top. Not only because they have a culture of individualism, which comes from the idea of originality of the scholars. So if I'm a scholar, why should I unite on more profane type of activities? But, you know, I think that, um, that you have to, to do more and to organize in an organized way to protect yourselves and your comrades. That's basic. To our last question, Patricia, right, from the think tank. Uh, well, I think you are right. I mean, the question is, is, a, is a good question. You know, you, you, we should ask whether the universities are doing enough on that. For instance, in the research I've been conducting here on South African universities, I can tell you that they are, in, in, this, in these questions, for instance, concrete question on the fourth industrial revolution, they are done, doing something. There are some of them that are already participating. Right? The Central Technology University, for instance, works with Aerosud, with the, 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 the South African Council for Industry and Innovation, for instance. So they, they are there, but they are, they are not, not asking questions. They are big experts on something. The questions are usually, the, the governments are asking the think tanks, not because the universities are not producing because if they are not producing, producing, they have the social responsibility to do that. So it is enough that your organization to fund research, organize a bid, a contest for the universities to develop more knowledge on the dilemmas of digital colonization in the future. What, what are the dilemmas and the challenges? And as usual, as you know, the think tanks, they all, always put opportunities and threats, because that's what the clients are they like, because they like to see threats, but they like to see opportunities. And if you, uh, and you are an expert, I've been uh, doing a lot of discourse analysis of, of, of their reports. In the end, the opportunities are always, you know, come out ahead of the threats, because that's what the client needs. So I think that the problem with the, with the think tanks is that you know, are the terms of reference. That's why, for instance, I never worked with World Bank, because once they invited me and I said, well, why don't we do that? But they said, well, but the conclusions, we have to see the conclusions and go through them. I said, no, please, <laughs> conclusions are mine. No. So I think that there are other opportunities. It may be a privileged case, but in Europe we have the the European Research Council, I just conducted a very large project called ALICE, and it was a very large, it was $3,670,000, so it's was a lot of money. But it was conducted, I could conduct that project in 22 countries, and there were no, no strings attached. Usually, we think tanks, the strings are part of the contract. And that's what makes it bad, because otherwise, uh, there are all conditions. For instance, uh, if you sometimes not not even the conclusions is what you can publish. Yeah, this is so, but you can publish it now. You pu you publish it later on. This is for me a disaster for scholarship. You know, because there are conditions that are, they're external to uh, the endeavor. So I think that we should ask more from the universities, but they should be encouraged, uh, actively encouraged by the governments. The problem is the governments don't like to do that. Modi in, I in India is really a, 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 a tragic case because they have a very good tradition of very powerful universities doing excellent work, and all of a sudden, he asked the policy reports from think tanks and not from the university. It was really humiliation for the university community, right? And we know why he did that, of course. 
because of this project. So I think, I think now we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very thought-provoking, but even more for the thought-inspiring um, opening to our conference, and for engaging with all the questions with so much generosity, and quite, in quite practical ways. I think there's a lot that we can take away that's not just theoretical, but that we can actually really think about how can we use this and, and um, um, develop our own practice, our own practice further. <clears throat>